there's a war at the heart of AI between the business consultants and the builders. And I want to outline how that popped out in sharp relief this week between Andre Carpathy and McKinsey. Both of them had major presentations uh, this week, major papers this week. I want to talk about how stark a contrast they laid out and why Andre's vision is more likely to be correct. It's important to understand both, though, because McKinsey has tremendous influence in the boardroom. Okay, first, understand the context for Carpathy's presentation. He's speaking to a bunch of entrepreneurs at Y Combinator's startup school. His presentation is titled Software 3.0, which he is sort of uniquely qualified to talk about because he coined the term Software 2.0 uh, a few years ago, I believe also at YC. So he's coming back and he's basically saying there's a new paradigm. It's shaped obviously by AI. And he spends a lot of time in the presentation, which I'm going to link, encouraging you to think about AI as a design problem that is unique because of the qualities of the large language model. And so he talks about large language models as computers, large language models as utilities, large language models as operating systems. And he describes in detail how LLMs have qualities that match these. So as an example for utilities, we meter their usage uh, dollars per token the way we meter electricity, right? Uh, for OSs, we've already heard other major figures in AI talk about the fact that especially young people are using AI like an operating system. And you have differences in preference for operating system, the Windows versus Mac wars. Well, similarly, you have differences in preference for Claude versus OpenAI. So you have some of that same sort of dichotomy playing out. But let's get to the heart of Software 3.0. Software 3.0 is the idea that the next coding language is English and that we are not working with deterministic software. Instead, we are working with what Carpathy terms people spirits. So stochastic simulations of people is the way he puts an LLM. I love that phrase. I'm going to keep and like share it a lot because it helps me explain why large language models feel so human but aren't. It explains why the intelligence of large language models feels so jagged. They are stochastic simulations of people. They're people spirits. And so if we're building software for this kind of interaction, for people spirits, we have to think from the ground up how we design our software. And this is where Andre's caution comes in, and I think it's really needed in an age when we are hyping up agents so much. It is really, really important to think about our building in the next six months, 18 months, two years, as building for people spirits that need a fair bit of human people supervision to go anywhere. And Andre is more honest about this than most of the other major figures in AI that I've seen. He is not overhyping and saying that AI agents will take over everything and be autonomous. And this is where you see an early conflict with McKinsey. Because what Andre is saying is essentially people spirits or LLMs just don't have the... Uh, reliable execution. They have too much jaggedness in their intelligence to be good at enough of everything to be trusted with high-level tasks at this point. Instead, we should be building our software for the assumption that humans will need to be validators in the loop, that AI can generate and human needs to validate. And we need to think about software as a design problem from that perspective. And he suggests there's two ways to make this easy. One is pretty obvious, make the the checking responsible validation loop as easy as you possibly can. That's software 101. But the second is a little bit more controversial. Andre suggests putting the LLM on a short leash, deliberately constraining AI generation so that you don't have so much AI generation that you overwhelm evaluators. An example of this would be the AI generating hundreds of different ad variants, but the human only being able to validate 10 of them. Well, what's the point? You're just wasting energy at that point. And I appreciate his honesty on that front. Now, I do not think that Andre is entirely correct, or at least I disagree with him, that English will be the only programming language of the future effectively. I think in particular, there will be a need for strong technical engineers who understand the construction of complex systems because systems are about to become more complex as we have traditional software interacting with this agentic augmented software that he's talking about. This is not going to be as clean as English driving code all the way through. But I do understand from his perspective as someone who's dipped in engineering from the beginning and like knows his code backward and forward, 
the transition to English is a fundamental shift. And he is, to his credit, honest about the limitations of the vibe coding revolution that he kicked off a few months ago. He was the one that said vibe coding and spawned a thousand startups. And so he talks about the fact, really honestly, that vibe coding right now is great for local environments, but there's a lot of other pieces in the deploy pipeline and in CICD and in integrations that don't work well with vibe coding right now. And I appreciated that honesty as well. So when you ladder all of that up, what he is basically saying, Andre is leaving us with this vision of software 3.0 as building like augmented Iron Man suits for ourselves, where the agents expand our, our span, our reach, our control. Uh, but we have to design our data systems to accommodate how they interact with data. We have to design our software so it's agent friendly. We have to think about agent control systems so that you can have agents interacting with data and people validating it in a sustainable loop. It's a really interesting software design talk and it's scalable and it's empirical. And because he is a builder, you can feel the fingertip knowledge. And that is the fundamental distinction between Andre's presentation of Software 3.0 and McKinsey's presentation, which is very, very different. McKinsey is speaking to CEOs. McKinsey, and look, I, I get that Mistral blessed the McKinsey presentation. Uh, it's all about agentic mesh. That's the theme. And like the CEO of Mistral has a nice introduction at the beginning. This is not an attack on Mistral. They do hard work. They produce mm -hmm. great software. But McKinsey, because of the way they speak to their audience, is not able to successfully articulate anything that's buildable for tech teams. And that is the fundamental issue. I understand that they want to communicate to CEOs in their presentations, and I'll link to this as well, that it is important to think in terms of workflows. That's true. It is important not to just think in terms of LLMs automating tasks. That's true. If you think about agents, you have to think about autonomy. That's true. The problem lies when they go from general concepts to try and suggest a solution. The agentic mesh is a word salad that has no empirical grounding. It doesn't have the builder's touch. And that is what makes that presentation so concerning because I've seen over and over again, as someone in sort of the product engineering side of things, when you have a CEO come in fresh off a report like that, and he's like, this should just work. The McKinsey guys say that they can build an agentic mesh and you can plug any model in without additional work. Why don't we use, uh, you know, Mistral Small or why don't we use GPT 3.5 Turbo? Because McKinsey mentioned it. Both of those are in the presentation, by the way. And the tech teams roll their eyes because they're like, these are ancient models. They're tiny. It relies on this assumption of edge computing that hasn't sustained very well because larger models just show sustained gains in intelligence that smaller models aren't matching. That's one of the big surprises of 2025 is that edge computing for models is not working as well as people thought it would yet. Um, and to his credit, Andre still thinks there's room for edge computing. We will see. Apple made a big bet on it earlier last year, and it really hasn't paid off. Uh, it remains to be seen. I don't want to sort of rabbit hole us on edge computing. That's probably a different conversation. The point sort of for McKinsey is that they should be able to recommend something that is actually buildable. And if you recommend what is effectively a theoretical substrate for agents that allows them to plug in like USB ports and any agent can plug in and you can plug in any data, that is a fiction for a CEO. That makes a CEO sleep well at night. It is not true. It is not how you actually build things. I understand because I've had to work with boards that you do have to simplify technical concepts into a business narrative. I understand that. I understand that you have to have outcomes that you can talk about that are easy for non-technical people to understand. It is possible to take Andre Carpathy's software 3.0 or a similarly clean technical vision and tell good business stories. You do not have to resort to the kind of um, sophistry, the kind of word salad that McKinsey uses in order to communicate clear business narrative. And in fact, the fact that the fact that they're doing that, right, the fact that they are telling a story that isn't real at root, because you can't just plug agents in like USB. Like you can't just plug them in without modification from any from any source whatsoever and stick them into data and just expect it all to magically work. It does not work that way. And if you sell that vision, what you are selling is the reason why so many enterprise companies are walking away from AI after an investment and why so many enterprise AI projects don't launch. It's because of advice like this. And so part of why I am punching up on McKinsey a little bit is I, I need people who have C-suite and board ears to tell the truth about building AI, to tell the truth about how complex AI systems are, that yes, there is a power law of payoffs. If you invest and you get true AI in agentic systems, 
and you can implement them at the enterprise level, there, are, there is big money on the table. It matters, but it's hard to get there. And if you are just starting out, that may not be the place you want to start out. You don't want to necessarily start out with automating your entire customer success line or automating all of your, oh, what have you, automating all of your uh, retail uh, orders and pickups. You get the idea. What you want to do is focus on a crawl, walk, run motion, describe the culture change you want and start living into that. And that's the piece I want to leave you with today. What is the culture change that Andre is suggesting we need to create in our organizations that enables us to think in terms of software 3.0, that enables us to think and relate to LLMs, not as people, not as programs, but as stochastic simulations of people in a probabilistic context. There's an emergent psychology to LLMs that is relevant to talk about, even if the psychology isn't, quote, real, because these are, quote, simulations. We can still talk about it and understand it, and that may be a window for us to understand how probabilistic agents interact with our software infrastructure. There's a lot to dig into, but I would much rather us dig into what is actually going on and tell business stories that actually matter than go to McKinsey's side of the fence to pretend everything is easy and get into a position where enterprise after enterprise starts on AI and walks away because they discover belatedly that it's much harder than the board deck says. It's just not true that you can plug in agents anytime. It's just not true that these tiny little edge models will do whatever you want and won't get eaten by the next large model that comes along. We need to do a better job telling truths up and down the stack. And I appreciate Andre for doing his best to lay that out. And I'm asking organizations like McKinsey to take a stronger stance there. And look, I, who am I kidding myself? They're not going to hear me. They're not going to listen. That's okay. I can still ask. I can still expect a better response to the challenge of AI. Cheers.